Good morning. Great morning. Uh, I am not a railroad historian. I am a historian, I'm not a railroad historian. My primary focus is on the New Deal and the really exciting area of banking history. Uh, I decided not to do anything on that. I didn't want to put you all to sleep. Uh, the title of this presentation was originally I'm going to take a trip to Laredo, which is the first line of a song by a band of horses from their song Laredo. Makes sense. But uh, I failed to notify Carolyn Town to get that on the program. It sounded good at the time. I chose it. It actually is totally irrelevant for what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it chose instead to uh, go with this up here, the Texas Mexican Railroad Successful Mexican American Bridge. Wine and continental United Uh-huh. That's what average news is at midnight. Uh, I will not be talking about the railroads in South Texas as indicated on the program, but only one the Texas Mexican Railway or the Tex Mex. Okay, here we go again. As is more commonly uh, no, the road began in the fertile mind of Uriah Lot. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and was charted to Corpus Christi, San Diego, and Rio Grande Narrow Gauge Railroad in 1875. Uh, Lot only arrived in Corpus Christi eight years uh, before and had operated a shipping company primarily focusing on wool and hides, which he shipped to New York via his shipping company, which consisted of three sailing ships which he had chartered. Uh, he also worked to improve the navigation into Corpus Christi Bay and into the harbor there. The initial stages of development were bankrolled by Midland Kennedy and possibly with the assistance of Richard King. I have just confirmed that or with Lisa Neely. Uh, two years after starting work, the road reached uh, Rancho Banquet, 25 miles from Corpus Christi in northwest Nueces County between 1877 and 1879, 52 additional miles of three foot wide narrow gauge track was added reaching San Diego. The construction of a narrow gauge line makes sense when one considers that the project was underfunded and narrow gauge line makes sense when one considers uh, the narrow gauge was cheaper to build, I'm sorry, than standard gauge. In theory, at least, narrow gauge can also make sharper turns and climb steep mountains with less trouble. But when looking at the route between Corpus Christi and Laredo, it does not have been a factor in the decision making process. So it came back to cost. Uh, initially, the purpose of the road was to transport cheap to the coast for subsequent shipment to markets to the east for sharing and slaughter. Despite, despite having a specific purpose, which many early railroads did not, the project was frequently referred to as Lock's Folly uh, in the early days of the project. Uh, in viewing the 1874 map entitled Corpus Christi and Rio Grande Valley Railway Company, the proposal was for a straight line from Corpus Christi to Laredo through what was Nueces, Duval, Ensenal, and Wood County. The actual route of the road, the actual road route of the road followed, meandered a bit more than a straight line, but eventually ended up in Laredo after traveling through Robstown on its way to Banquet, and then on to Hopperville to Alice, San Diego, Rialtos, and Erinville. Between 1877 and 1881, after some difficulties, the road reached Laredo, fulfilling its name by going to San Diego to reach the Gateway City. It was the first railroad line to reach Laredo, with that city's important connection to northern Mexico. Later that year, a competing line, the International and Great Northern, would complete its road into Laredo as well, giving shippers the option of going to the Texas coast on the Corpus Christi, San Diego, and Rio Grande Narrow Gauge Railway or to the interior of the United States through San Antonio on the International and Great Northern. 
to more accurately reflect its operations at the same year the name of the Corpus Christi San Diego and Rio Grande Narrow Gauge Railway. That is a mouthful. <laughs> uh, uh, was changed to the Texas Mexican Railway Corporation and reflected broader function, which still included the shipment of sheep to the coast. In 1883, an international whale bridge was built across the Rio Grande connecting Laredo and the Huevo Laredo. And by 1889, a rail, all rail connections were made, making it possible to travel from Mexico to Canada completely by rail. Uh, this bridge would have a devastating impact on the barge traffic between Rio Grande City, Carmago, Brownsville, and Los Brazos de Santiago, with the international traffic now moving by rail through Laredo. In 1881, before the road reached Laredo, Watt and Kennedy traveled to New York and sold the road to a syndicate headed by William J. Palmer and James Sullivan. Although Palmer had served in the Civil War, he, like Kennedy, had been raised a Quaker. It is possible that through their common religious affiliation, plus both being from Pennsylvania, the two knew each other before uh, Lott and Kennedy, or Lott and uh, Kennedy made their trip to New York. Another possibility is that Lott was already acquainted with Palmer, who was then in the process of building the Mexican National Railway from Nuevo Laredo to Mexico City. As soon as the acquisition was made, Palmer's syndicate completed the remaining 110 miles of road into Laredo. Two years later, Palmer, who was already the president of the Mexican National Railway, that was some discussion, would complete the line uh, to Nuevo Laredo. Previously, Palmer had been involved with the construction of the Kansas Pacific Railroad and built the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad, which was the most extensive narrow gauge railroad in the country. It was Palmer and his syndicate who would have the road rechartered under the name of the Texas Mexican Railway Company. The new charter authorized the company to construct the line from San Diego to Sabine River to the Sabine River with branches which would run through Tyler, Galveston, and San Antonio. In 1881, the Tex-Mex bought the Galveston, Brazos, and Colorado Railroad for entry into Galveston, but the plan to build a connecting line was never followed through on. Aside from being an aggressive railroad promoter, Palmer was also something of a visionary, having seen as a young man that it would be coal that would be the fuel for steam locomotives, not wood. Having said that, let me note that the tradition of forward-looking management has been a hallmark of the Tex-Mex conception. Sources, while not necessarily offering uh, different uh, information about the operation of Tex-Mex during the last two decades of the 19th century, are somewhat unclear about its ownership. Some say the Tex-Mex was operated directly by the Mexican National Railway uh, during the period from 1881 through 1888. But things got a little bit murky here, or get a little bit murky here. According to some sources, Palmer became the president of the Mexican National Railroad in 1890. However, however Fred Wilbur Powell, uh, in his Railroads of Mexico, states that Palmer was the head of the Mexican National Railway Construction Company, a Colorado corporation, which received the charter only to build the road. It was only as sections were completed that title was transferred to the Mexican National Railway, which also happened to be a Colorado company headed up by Palmer. In some places, though, Palmer was not listed as the president of the Mexican National Railway Company. So that, that's a little murky as to exactly what he was uh, in relationship to that. Uh, simultaneously building from both ends of the route, from Mexico City and Nuevo Laredo, uh, it was not long before the construction company was soon beset by financial problems and control of the company passed to English interests who came up with the money to complete the construction process. The Mexican National Construction Company only kept title to a short line between Manzanillo and Colima and with an unfinished portion of the road between Zacatecas and Ojo Caliente. The railroad company, now controlled by English interests, took over the rest. 
If that is the case, then during the period of the eight years mentioned above, the Tex-Mex is operated by interests other than American, an American company, or by any Mexican private commercial interest. It was also during this period that the Tex-Mex gained access to the rest of the country when another project of lots was completed, the San Antonio and Ranges Path Railroad reached out. In 1900, nine years before the nationalization in Mexico, the Texas Mexican Railway was sold to the Mexican government, which owned it until 1982. Again, this is a little murky. I'm not entirely certain about this. Uh, there was some disagreement in the sources about this period. George Warner in the Handbook of Texas Online was silent regarding the ownership and the operation of the railroad in the first decade of the 20th century, stating only that in 1906 the Tex Mex absorbed the Mexican Northern Railroad. Powell states that financial problems associated with the conversion to standard gauge, which they started on the Mexican National in 1901, resulted in the control of the Mexican National passing to a new corporation, the National Railway Company of Mexico, organized in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Further, Warner states that in 1906, the Texas Mexican absorbed the Mexican Northern. Think about this. The Texas Mexican is absorbing the Mexican Northern. I'll leave it there. While the Nexus, the, the, the Mexican Northern was organized, built, and operated by American interests, out of New York. <laughs> Powell makes no mention of it having been absorbed by the Mexican National Railway. In fact, running between Ensenal in Chihuahua and Sierra Mojada in Coahuila, it connected to the Mexican Central rather than to the Mexican National. The Mexican National now passed back into the hands of an American corporation, the one organized in Utah, of which Palmer was the president, supposedly. <laughs> While uh, it acquired additional narrow gauge railroads in Mexico, it also began the conversion of the Mexican National to a standard gauge in 1902, the year that the Texas Mexican completed its conversion to standard gauge. One of the railroads which came under the control of the National Railway Company of Mexico, the Utah Company. <laughs> was the Interoceanic, a British narrow-gauge road that ran from Mexico City to Veracruz. Under the terms of the acquisition, control of the Mexican national passed to the Mexican government. In order for the Mexican national to take over the Oceanic, the Mexican government is going to start running. Only in Mexico. <laughs> During the murky years in which it was owned by the Mexican government, the Tex-Mex oversaw the creation of the San Diego and Gulf Railway, a road of just over two and a half miles that ran from the sulfur mines in Palenque, if I pronounce that right, and connected with the Tex-Mex and Bryan in Duval County. That road was operated by the Duval Texas Sulfur Company, a subsidiary, subsidiary of Union Gas Company. In 1930, the Tex-Mex took control of the road, operated in 1935 when the mine was closed and abandoned the road in 1939. At some point, the title of the Tex-Mex was transferred to the Transportation Maritima Mexicana, or TMMSA, the Mexican Maritime Shipping Company that was organized in 1958. In 1992, TMM formed a joint venture to truck goods into the United States. Subsequently, in 19, what happened right about that time? What's under negotiation? NAFTA. So people are getting, and, and railroads are, are proving to be unprofitable. Uh, subsequently, in 1995, TMM sold 49% <coughs> of the Tex Mex to Kansas City Southern Industries, Inc. Uh, best known as the Cape. Finally, in August 2004, the Katie bought controlling interest in the Tex-Mex pending 
regulatory approval, which it obtained at the end of 2004. Uh, the Tex-Mex at this point becomes a domestically owned line again. In 2005, Katie took full control of both the Tex-Mex and the American portion of the International Bridge and Laredo, connecting it to the major railroad company in central Mexico through the Web Laredo. The Katy and the Tex-Mex now operate as one railroad. The first decade of the 20th century proved to be fruitful for the Tex-Mex as connections were made along the route to other roads opening up the entire country to roads the dock which crossed the border at Laredo. In 1903, the line connected with the St. Louis, Brownsville, and Mexico Railroad and Robstown, which had been chartered on June 1 uh, of that year. At least Amelia will be talking about that uh, this afternoon. Despite its relatively small size, the company remained progressive in its operations. In 1939, uh, the Tex-Mex acquired seven diesel locomotives to become the first dieselized, fully dieselized rail company in the country. The, ne uh, the next year that Tex-Mex was selected to operate the 19-mile track between Corpus Christi and the Naval Air Base at Flower Mound. In 1891, Governor Lou Ross, in his last annual message to the state legislature, noted that smallpox no longer a problem in the United States was frequently a problem in Mexico. Ross wanted the President of the United States to encourage the Mexican authorities to take the necessary steps to eliminate smallpox there, but further he requested that the Marine Hospital Service, with its Texas headquarters in El Paso, Marine El Paso, I'm from El Paso, so, you know, there's not a lot of water there, guaranteed. Uh, to uh, start inspecting all trains coming in from Mexico, crossing the river from Mexico. Uh, but he also requested that the medical inspectors quarantine anyone showing signs of the disease. In 1891, the only rail crossing into Texas from Mexico were in El Paso and across the International Bridge in Laredo, connecting the Texas. Uh, as Governor Lou Ross was aware, railroads transported other things than cargo and passengers. The opening of the railroad and the development of towns along the route created an avenue for the transmittal of communicable diseases. In 1900, the U.S. Army Medical Research Team, headed by Walter Reed, confirmed that yellow fever was transmitted by the Aegis aegypti mosquito. A vaccine for the disease was developed in 1904. The last major outbreak of the disease in the United States was in New Orleans in 1905. Prior to the announcement and the wide distribution of vaccine, practical measures were taken to prevent the spread of the disease, especially in the southern region of the United States. Usually that involved inspection of residences, especially those without running water. Barrels of water were dumped when possible, and if not possible, water barrels were sprayed with oil, and the houses were fumigated with mosquitoes and larvae. In 1904, Representatives of the Public Health Service working diligently inspecting houses, dumping water barrels, or using oil to prevent mosquito breeding in those barrels. Reports were rendered usually weekly to the Public Health Service in Washington. Those reports were published and included monthly reports on work done along the Tech Next Railway that year. During the week ending February 6, 1904, Acting Assistant Surgeon Prick fumigated 44 houses containing 59 rooms in the town of Laredo and along the track line as far as 10 miles out. In a report of July 1, 1904, reported that Alice had been fumigated. For the week of August 20th, past assistant surgeon Richardson reported that he had fumigated 34 houses containing 154 rooms in addition to two cisterns. Further, he had inspected 7,273 premises and oiled over 1,000 water containers. Busy man. Uh, acting Assistant Surgeon McGregor was inspecting along the Texas Mexican Railway line. Also included was a report on the act, uh, activity across the river in New Laredo, their turn, but no indication whether that was being done by American inspectors or their Mexican counterparts. Two months later, on September 30th, another report. In another report to Washington, Acting Assistant Surgeon McGregor reported one case of hematuria, 
accompanied by a temperature of 104 <coughs> indicative of malaria. However, the patient had traveled to Laredo from Wharton County by train, not from Mexico. Further, the patient advised the greater that there were several other cases with symptoms similar to hers in the Horton County area. To assure that there was no development, McGregor also reported that he would leave the next day for house and would inspect the area in San Diego and other communities along the way. One other thing I would like to comment on is that with the Tex-Mex running through San Diego, one would anticipate some problems during the halcyon days of the Mexican Revolution. This was the same period when Mexican anarchists and others published the Plan of San Diego and proposed the creation of the Republic of the Rio Grande. It is during this period when trestles of the St. Louis Brownsville and Mexico Railroad were set on fire and the Brownsville itself. Additionally, attempts were made to do the same to trestles of the International and Great Northern north of Laredo. One set of trestles along the International and Great Northern were soaked with kerosene but before the torch could be set to them, the perpetrators were disrupted, killed, or run off. The torch was never put to use, and the trestles never burned. However, the attempt was made. From everything I have found, no attempt was made on any of the Tex-Mex bridges. Given that the Tex-Mex was owned by the Mexican government at the time, such as it was, uh, it makes one question whether the perpetrators were who were supposedly followers of uh, Ricardo Flores Magón, or anarchists as he was, or really Mexican nationals taking an opportunity to, to create disruption as they presented themselves. During World War I, the Tex-Mex, like the other railways of the country, fell under the control of the government. During the period from December 26, 1917 to March 1, 1920, the government transported three point heavy loads without any attention to maintenance of those roads. When the Esch Cummings Act of 1920 returned the roads to private control, because of the poor condition of the roads, the anti-business attitude which previously had led to the passage of the Sherman Antitrust Act and subsequent legislation was no longer persistent no longer persisted. Under the terms of the Act, regulation of the railroad industry was placed in the hands of the Interstate Commerce Commission, and its control was viewed as adequate to permit the formation of combinations and pools necessary to improve service, promote the economy of operation, and not restrain competition. What I found interesting about the Edge Cummins Act is that in the literature surrounding the passage and the application of the Act, the text mesh was frequently mentioned as an example of a road that could be easily combined with others that was already owned or at least operated by another road, the Mexican National, over which the Interstate Commerce Commission had no direct authority. Again, the confusion, murkiness, if you will, over the exact ownership of the Tex-Mex. It was no secret, it is no secret in the post-World War II era that the rail industry has suffered uh, as it was supplanted by the trucking industry. This has occurred even outside the United States with firms such as Grupo TMMSA uh, have abandoned their ties to the maritime and rail transportation and gone strictly to trucking. This transition was further encouraged by the type of consolidation authorized by the Edge Cummings Act as companies struggled to stay viable and in business. One of the unique features of many of the smaller lines such as the Tex-Mex is that they are bridge lines connecting two other major lines carrying little freight which originates along their own route. Almost from its inception, the Tex-Mex has served this, this purpose, moving freight from Corpus Christi to Laredo and over its co-owned international bridge to Nuevo Laredo and also freight moving in the other direction. Today, uh, Corpus Christi serves as a major entrepot for goods arriving in the United States from Mexico by ship, the railroad serves the same purpose for goods coming from the interior of Mexico. The Tex-Mex moves large amounts of incoming international shipping for the Southern Pacific and Corpus. In addition, it plays a major role in moving goods in and out of the Houston Ship Channel for its parent, the Katy. As one of the oldest bridge carriers in the South, it continues to play a major role in the economy of South and Southeast Texas. I hope that someone else will pick up 
uh, the ball and run with it from here. There is an awful lot more of work that needs to be done on this railroad. There's a lot more important uh, information that needs to really be dug out of uh, Mexican records and some of the other before. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, sure. When you talk about these, uh, the conglomerates of all these people, was it strictly financial or were they into all kinds of stuff? The syndicates, as you call them, were. Well, I get like Palm. Palm was a builder. Okay. Uh, a lot like Lot, he was more a promoter or, yeah. and, and a builder than, than interested in. He was, he was interested in making money. Okay. And he made a lot of money over the year, but railroad construction is an expensive proposition, and they couldn't always come up with the funds they needed. So a lot of times, these, these companies run out of business almost as fast as they were You don't see the type of manipulation in Mexico to the degree that you do in the United States with the ability to, and of course in Texas you got the situation where we, Texas owned its own public lands. There's no transfer to the railroad company when they complete a mile of land like they did under the terms of the Pacific Railroad Act. Um, well, why did they go back east to Utah and all these other places? The money? Was it all about the money they need? To you know, I haven't had time to get into the, the, uh, the company that was organized in Utah, but you have to remember that there, Utah was a state then, but there was also large Mormon communities in northern Mexico, that, and again, I'm, I'm, it's a supposition. Yeah. But I suspect it's that way. In fact, from why that particular company was organized in Utah, that Palmer to me is interesting because he's a Quaker. Uh, that's a odd combination with Quakers and Mormons. But. Okay. Thanks. Money. Money talk. Money. Yeah. Money talk. Any other questions? Sure. Professor Hibbert. Wait, I'm going to type this off for a moment.